Namaskar and welcome to this exciting new episode of Satology Debunking Mythology. You have heard us on many topics and today we are going to a little bit change and introduce a new topic, the medical achievements of the Indian culture, ancient Indian Vedic culture. And we have, we have very famously heard the story of Dhritarashtra having 100 sons, actually 101, and, uh, and also one daughter, Dushala. So we have seen that and how they came about. And, uh, and that is a very classical story of, uh, of Dhritarashtra having 100 sons. And uh, also we have heard stories of how uh, the, the, the head of Ganesh was changed. And uh, we had, uh, you know, Daksha, Prajapati, we had a whole, the whole story that how he, elephant head, we call it Ganesh God, the elephant head. So today we have a very renowned researcher joining and uh, her reference came none, from none other than Nilesh Oak. And, uh, and she has done her own research on the achievements of Vedic sciences, especially in the genetic side and, uh, and plastic surgery. So without delay, let us welcome Srimitra Desai. Namaste Adityaji, thank you for having me. You're most welcome. And she has joined all the way from Australia. Eh? Yes, I'm speaking to you from the land of uh, none of all people. Oh, wonderful. So, so, so in, in, in Australia, when you discuss these things from the Indian culture that how plastic surgery and many other things are there. What is the general reaction? It can be two different reactions. One is uh, that of disbelief that this is even possible. But then because the indigenous people have been here for 65,000 years and they talk about it so proudly, for them it is like, oh yeah, possible. So you get a, a variety of a spectrum of uh, reactions. Uh -huh. So what, what is the, if you, if you see in, into this topic, what is the ancient recorded history of India on, on, for example, plastic surgery. So with that one, actually, uh, we did a fascinating exercise a couple of years ago. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Nileji, whom you've already hosted on your channel. And um, uh, honestly, I must admit, I had no idea of the information that would have been out there at the time. So it was a fascinating journey of uh, discovering plastic surgery and how it went on to shape surgery uh, later on, but specifically what the uh, Indian contribution was um, and sadly how it was erased as well. So that was what I found out. Um, our, our journey actually started with a story. Um, it starts with a publication in the Gentleman's Magazine. Now this was in uh, October, 1794. And uh, the letter in that magazine uh, there's a letter which says that two uh, British doctors, Caruso and Findlay, they have witnessed a surgery uh, in India. And they describe that as a curious chirurgical operation. And uh, that is basically the beginning of our journey where they describe that a nose that has been castrated has been fixed. And uh, how it actually heals better than what the Italians or the Europeans were facing at the time. Because... What they would do is they would take uh, part of the skin from the cheek or the thigh. And once it was completely removed uh, and fitted onto the nose, the skin would die off. So the Indians had an ingenious um, minor modification that actually let the skin fall on and heal completely. And that rendered uh, such a major change that, it was fa that fascinated Europe at the time. India is already fascinating many people at the same time. And essentially the Americans, they were really shocked when India sent the Mars mission cheaper than the cost of the Mars movie. And I think that caught the attention of most of the American scientists, actually rocket scientists. And, and actually Obama actually commented during that time that that's a remarkable achievement of Indians. And also Indians are very respected in USA, particularly in the field of medicine. Every seventh patient in the U.S. is seen by an Indian doctor. So, mm -hmm. so generally, if you see any movie or anywhere, there will be some brown skin Indian with an Indian, some funny Indian accent. Even though that guy is a purely American, they'll make him or her speak American accent, a little bit Indianish accent, and come on the mm -hmm. show because that's the kind of credibility they've built in. So, uh, 
Now, coming back to the our question about the vaccines, also because the vaccines is such a major uh, discussion nowadays, political discussion as well as so what was the achievement of Vedic sciences in the vaccines area? So, um, with vaccines, actually, I've only just finished completing a um, book that I'm hoping to offer to the readers in January next year. Uh, but what I found there was. I worked primarily with uh, the smallpox uh, vaccine, and that was such a widespread problem. Um, you can say it was similar to COVID or larger in terms of uh, the reach that it had, and it affected everybody. And uh, we've struggled with this particular um, treatment for a very long time. So we know that from the third century onwards, there are documented instances of uh, uh, smallpox, and yet for the longest time, there was no cure. And then we come to 1800s, and that's when Edward Jenner um, has developed the vaccine. So that is what we know. But when you look at it from the Indian perspective, what you find is Bharat had actually been successfully treating smallpox for a very long time, much prior to uh, Edward Jenner. And uh, Essentially, what I found was that the information came from tribal knowledge. It may have come from um, Ayurveda as well. Whether it was a combination of the two, we will need to do more research. But it was that information that was then in the 1700s co-opted um, by the British um, doctor, surgeon Howell. And that was presented um, at a college in UK. And that information then goes on to lead to the major vaccine researches that we see today. But you hear none of this. You hear absolutely nothing of this uh, in the mainstream. Even if you, for example, go to Wikipedia or any of the websites, you'll find that there's no information about this particular contribution at all. But when you're talking about Edward Jensen, a dairy maiden by the name of uh, Sarah Nelms, James no prior information to that, as if it was a standalone discovery. So India has had a major role to play in that. And I think it's time that we start telling our stories and do a bit more research. No, absolutely right, Mitraji. The, the thing is there that uh, most of the information from India, now, now Indians had a very democratic structure, and, uh, and which means that the, these kind of life-saving discoveries were easily spread amongst the masses. In the West, you know, health is a privilege, not a right. So only the rich can afford a good health care. I can tell you about America. Only the rich and uh, can afford a good health care. In 350 million Americans, only 70% only have a right for a good health care. Only 70%. And the rest, 30%, they don't go by any insurance, including good, good people who can afford, they don't want to pay it. So that's the nature of uh, American in the Western Hemisphere. And, and if you see the, in, the, uh, in the 1600s, the British monarchy would give the best access to the nobles of British uh, kingdom. And the rest of the people had to die. And the Winston Churchill, you know, very famously had called Indians as insects and let almost 30 million people die in, in famine in Bang Bengal. I call Bill Churchill the bulldog of British. So, but uh, but you know this has been a history. So, where do the Indian medical science? I mean, uh, Shushruta, you were saying you mentioned the word. How does that Indian medical science, uh, even though it well documented, but did not spread amongst the masses? Or 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 you can correct me also, please. Uh, before before I go there, let me share my American experience. So. I um, came to America right after 9-11 and I was uh, there for my master's. I've done my master's in criminal justice from University of Cincinnati. And uh, within the first few months itself, I went, I was playing basketball and I managed to break uh, my ankle and I went to the hospital there. Uh, I had minimal insurance or something like that. And all they did was they sent me back with some painkillers and uh, crutches and a $1,200 bill appeared in my uh, mail a few months, a few weeks later. 
And I was in shock because I had no idea at the time. It was just the first few weeks of being in, in America. So it was quite interesting uh, that it was such an expensive treatment at the time as a student, when you don't have a lot of money, it is uh, an expensive thing to uh, go through. But that being said, now Sushrut and uh, his contributions, it's not just Sushrut, but it's also Charak Samhita, Vag Bhatta, Madhavakara. There's many uh, people who've contributed to the sciences, um, uh, Ayurveda and the medical sciences. Sushrut is the one that we hear most uh, often, but his works and Charaka's works, what we don't know is that their works were translated into uh, Persian and Arabic from as early as 850. So uh, long before you start seeing this information being mainstream in the European context and being used by the Europeans, we've already done the knowledge transfer. So I think, give me one second, I'll give you the exact ones. Uh, Actually, under the first Kusro, by 531, uh, the, there's a Persian doctor, Burzao. He's, he's traveled to India, and he's taken back medical books. So the Charak Samhita, it was translated into Arabic. Uh, Sushrut Samhita was also translated. So by 850 AD, we already have the Persian Arabic physician who's translated Kitab Firdos al-Hikmah. And that is the one that outlines the Indian medical systems um, that Vagbhata, Madhavkara, they have extensively talked about. So India did the knowledge transfer uh, quite a long time ago before it became mainstream. Now, Sushrut's uh, genius was that his, uh, his uh, work was so precise and also the instruments that were used by Sushrut, they go on to become uh, the, uh, the, what shall I say, the stimulus for, for change. So there, there's one particular uh, snapshot that appears in Dr. Kunjalal Bishagratna, Bishagratna's translation of Sushrut Samhita, where he, where he actually uh, gives us some information by a German scholar, a German doctor, Dr. Hirschberg. And he tells us that the whole plastic surgery in Europe, it took a new flight when the cunning devices of Indian workmen became known to us. And the extract further goes to tell us that Sushrut is attributed with the glory of discovering the art of cataract crouching, which was unknown to the surgeons of uh, ancient Greek and Egypt. Limbs were amputated, abdominal sections uh, were performed, mm -hmm. fractures were said, dislocations, hernia, ruptures, you name it. And there was information and work that Ayurveda had already done. And that was what was uh, transferred out of India. It's an irony that Indian Medical Association today is opposing Ayurvedic operational sequences. <laughs> Just as we yes. are discussing, that's the latest. Uh, that's the latest opposition to that. What do you call Indian Medical Association as then? I, <laughs> I'm not so sure. It, it is quite ironic. Uh, that they're asking for the modern sciences to remain purist when in fact you'll find that a lot of what we call modern medicine is based on this uh, Indic and ancient wisdom. So I'm not sure that they quite understand their own value proposition. No, absolutely true. Like uh, when, when this was published, now uh, American Medical Association nowadays prescribes yoga as a therapy nowadays for patients. Now, every single uh, medical institution, like if they have any problem, the doctors say practice yoga for peace. Mm -hmm. so they're, ex they're accepting one part of it. But the insurance companies won't fund the, uh, the Ayurveda aspect of it. The reason is, if the Ayurveda is introduced, then the conventional Western medicine, which is highly risky, more patients die of the Western medicines then by Western cure, you know, like, like chemotherapy is one example. Then most people do not survive chemotherapy more than three years. After chemotherapy, three, if chemotherapy was not there, a patient might have survived, might, I'm saying might because I'm not a doctor, longer. That's what I, many people have claimed. Uh, so so, so the, the natural uh, therapy from Ayurvedic medicines is uh, 
you know how it is actually cures the disease at the at the root itself right madhumay is one example madhumay diabetes can be easily cured by ayurvedic ayurvedic medicines so what can we emphasize from your own research from the indian medical science that some things have to be taken more seriously and obviously for other things also modern science can corroborate it or can complement it but to elongate the life what is your what is your research say on that um now here i will draw not just on my research but my own uh, health experience what i've experienced is um voice content sorry just one second what i've experienced is uh, i've had challenging health issues and i've had the opportunity to uh, draw on both the modern medicine as well as ayurvedic and um what i found was the fix that i got from modern medicine was mainly topical or it addressed the actual symptom but when i went to ayurveda for the same issue it tried to find the root cause so uh, what i found was my experience with ayurveda was much more holistic so we can talk about the holistic uh, treatment um, but i find that forthcoming more within the ayurveda area than with modern medicine so when i went to ayurveda Uh, it demanded that i fix my uh, lifestyle or the food that i ate uh, the things that that i did um, settling down my nerves or even uh, doing meditation and things like that so it was it was more of a uh, broad broader change but at the same time they were treating the actual um, root cause as well so the changes that i had come out of my ayurvedic treatment were much more long lasting and what i found was when i did go to the modern medicine um it, it often one cycle led to another cycle and another cycle that i kept on treating um instead ayurveda was a much more holistic view so in response to the question what i would say is they they can be complementary they don't have to be pitted against each other these can be treated as complementary so there there's a place for both of them um but disregarding ayurveda altogether um that would be a folly that that will be something that we'll do at our own peril so what are the other examples of vaccines uh, which are available which were available in ancient india because the vaidya has always been there doctors are always there you know there is a there is an example of vaidya in mahabharat there is an example of vaidya in uh, ramayan sanjeevani a very popular example and and these are always been there it's not that people were without any medicine system in the past maybe in western history yes there can be in the modern because they don't recognize any history beyond 2000 years but mm-hmm. uh, but but the history has has always been there so what are the other examples of vaccines or the cures available for the common people based on your research um so i don't have a specific example about vaccine per se but how they were available for common people what i found was um when i was doing the research for smallpox vaccines the information documented uh by british themselves in uh, whether it was the calcutta presidency or the madras presidency the information tells us that the treatments were available to every strata of the society and uh, somehow the indian system had developed a way to deliver that to that strata based on what they were comfortable with so you had barbers who were able to deliver a uh, variolation it's called not so vaccination mm-hmm. is what gender did but the indian version was variolation and you had barbers who were able to deliver that you had garland makers who were able to deliver that uh, particular treatment so it was it may have been as simple as you are going to your local um, garland maker or your local barber and getting your tikka or your vaccination but on the other hand what you see is uh, when this variolation went to europe they were so skeptical they had trouble with introducing variolation for the longest time and they actually conducted human experiments so uh, it was about i think five or six prisoners from newgate prison they were experimented upon for the smallpox vaccine and when it was successful there only then it was given to the british royalty 
And after that experiment, they said, all right, so now the adults are taken care of. What about the children? And so then they went and found uh, orphans from the Westminster Parish and they experimented on them. And then the vaccine was introduced to the royalty, ch uh, children within the royalty. And it took them nearly uh, about two decades before they introduced that vaccine to the middle class. And then another couple of decades before it went to the lowest strata. So here you have a hierarchy which is going through its experimentation before it can reach the lowest strata. And on the other spectrum, you have Bharat, which had already made it available to everyone you can think of. So ironic that today Bharat is looking for buying vaccines from abroad. It's very it is. ironic. It's, and I think, uh, and they are actually helping the other companies grow up and share market because India is the biggest market right now. And they are buying 1.6 million doses of vaccine against uh, the current pandemic. Now, uh, coming back to this, uh, very interesting, very interesting, actually. There is a phenomena called Colombian exchange. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't, actually. So Colombian exchange is a phenomena in 1492, when Christopher mm -hmm. Columbus discovered South America by mistake. And, uh, and there, the Europeans used to send their almost sick people completely to mm -hmm. Uh, to Barbados and South America and through that they introduced diseases in South America mm -hmm. and their idea was to uh, wipe out the entire population through smallpox and other diseases which usually came from uh, European slaughterhouses mm -hmm. and that's how they introduced them to South America and that's called euphemistically called Colombian exchange looks very very beautiful term and but the if impact has been devastating, you know, almost 100 to 300 million, I would say, because my counts are hidden, have been killed in South America and North America, including Native Americans. Uh, coming back to Native Americans also, and also the aborigines of Australia, I mean, don't you think they were already having some kind of nature based therapies available? Otherwise, how would they survive such large populations? Um, yes, that, that was something I came across while I was uh, reading up on, on this as well, that the native population, um, by and large, originally did not have that. And we talk about all of these uh, weapons, um, biochemical weapons, and um, it yes, they've done it for a long time. So there's similar references to the Colombian exchange that you mentioned with uh, with the Indian American population as well, where it was deliberately uh, introduced. Um, with, with the Australian one, it has only come to Australia. Smallpox specifically came to Australia in about the 18th century, but it was also around the time when the vaccination had started. So um, I don't know whether we've seen that devastating uh, effects here, but by and large, yes, it was well known that they actually introduced that deliberately. So quite, quite malicious to say really. And then interestingly, you now get uh, the pre preachy version of uh, holier than thou. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very remarkable thing. Now we are told that how they are helping the whole world. And yes. there's a recent cartoon there that the, uh, you know, and uh, in the current pandemic vaccine has been created. So the rats are saying they're going to first test on humans, then on us <laughs> because they do <laughs> Because uh, because the the cycle they have to produce is so fast, and mm -hmm. uh, and and there is also being a new concept called uh, the chipping the human beings. Mm -hmm. So they want to introduce chips in the human body so that they can monitor vaccine uh, in the status. Because all these vaccines which are coming, they can only perform for three months. So again, so uh, so the whole concept is to have to make vaccination as a business. So you'll have every quarter, everyone has to get vaccinated for some uh, or the other disease, you know, some of the other disease. So, they, so that is why if you go to something like Ayurved, then there will be no business to do because it will actually cure people. So this, these are two different ways of looking at life, resources, everything, uh, like two different paradigms altogether. One's to fix whatever whatever malady is keeping you unwell and make you healthy and the others trying to make sure you stay there. 
yeah. unhealthy the the biggest the biggest obstacle nowadays is the doctors and the doctor communities themselves who make mm-hmm. a huge money on selling health uh, which is a birthright which is a biggest problem right now and where uh, and i think people are not realizing it but the 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 uh, in australia also they follow pretty much american system insurance and the hospitals they tied into each other it's a big economic system now you know so there was a very famous uh, saint who said uh if somebody asked him so now with the modern medicine and everything the general health is increasing so his comment was are the hospitals increasing or decreasing so somebody said they're increasing i said then how is the health improving because if the hospitals are increasing that means the diseases are also increasing so what is the what is the your perspective based on your research is what are the different types of vaccines available or which can help people different types of vaccines yeah for which um, type of diseases type which kinds of diseases okay so i have to <laughs> i have to qualify here i'm not a medical researcher i'm not uh, a medical doctor <laughs> so i'm not going to speak on uh, the types of vaccines there are uh, what i what i will say though is no, from, the, uh, from the point of view of your research like from the ancient indian like vedic point of view or what history that you're talking about yes so um, with that one like i said before uh, so vaccine is a point in time or a stand alone fix but when you look at the the medical system that we have in place it was much more holistic so for example when we are talking about variolation with the small box when they come in to variolate uh, variolation was basically where they took the pus from or an already infected person and they introduced that to uh, into a healthy person so what they did was it triggered the same infection is uh, just in a much milder form into this uh, new person and that person then became immune to that disease so what you find is uh, is it was not just about the vaccination itself it was accompanied with a lot of other dietary prescriptions that you cannot have so if you went to the bengal uh, record you will find that there were restrictions on what food they could eat they could not eat rice they could not eat machhi so it wasn't just about that so what you can do is if you compare it with your modern vaccination uh what you see is you just get that tikka um and you come home and you're back to normal with your work instead here you find that that person had a specific diet they were even prescribed open the doors open the windows you have to remain cool um the family had to go through certain precautions as well to not approach them things like that so it was it was a much more comprehensive uh treatment rather than just a uh one of fix yes it has become easier with something like vaccination but uh going back for the times that they were doing it they were taking as much precautions as possible and ensuring a much more holistic health and well-being of the person they were dealing with great points actually i i think that's the even the modern principle is like that you do uh that's how you build the immunity you know i think uh when people will start covid-19 uh, vaccines and they'll find that now coming back to uh, one more aspect that you mentioned the holistic part and uh, you know the the recovery from the modern medicine system is very hard on the body uh, generally like if somebody falls sick the, the recovery takes more time and uh, in in the indian context there is a mention of panchamrat which is uh, honey ghee and uh, five elements are there yogurt which are used as medicines tremendously and there is a concept of clean stomach in the indian culture that mm-hmm. you keep your stomach clean and if the stomach is clean then naturally the uh, body is going to stay healthy and is going to digest but in the in the western medicine is very chemical based that view if you have a disease instead of taking precautions just take the medicine and uh, so is there any recommendations in your based on your research like uh, when you when you you're writing the book about plastic surgery and other things 
is there any mention that what kind of natural uh, cures are also there or are are this a tradition like that so um it's interesting that you that you said uh, the stomach now you will see that the western research is only now starting to talk about the gut microbiome and how it is affecting your mental health and things like that but um, the ayurveda has such vast information i can't even claim to have studied all of it or any of it really but uh, this things like shankha prakshalan where you use just uh, water and a specific um, uh, percentage of salt and you drink that for extended period of time until it cleanses you from the inside they tell you that if you go through that process um you will have your body temperature will go up or you'll have a mild fever for the next two or three days and then you are relining your uh, insides with something as simple as uh, khichdi with a lot of ghee and you're basically resetting uh, your system after all of the after you've uh, removed all of the infections and things like that so there's heaps of information there but the beautiful thing is that they were able to uh, prescribe or customize it for the person that they were attending to it wasn't a uh, you know one solution for everyone it was customizable for each of the person that they uh, attended to so yes there's heaps of information um i i i'm waiting to explore and research that a bit more i wish i were a medical doctor so that i could understand it better and uh, do it quicker unfortunately i didn't end up doing that uh, but i can study about it now no, no great points i think and i think it's a very uh, you know you given us a lot of pointers and i invite you for more shows so we can cover specific <laughs> areas in more detail okay sure now, now my last question for the uh, is why did you choose this topic of research what was the interest because you just said you did criminal justice and yes. here you're writing a <laughs> book on uh, on uh, vaccinations and history what did, what interested you uh partly my own health challenges and trying to find a solution and also i come from a family of uh, healers so my my grandfather on my mother's side on my father's side uh, they were both ayurved tirthas so quite well reputed uh my my foray into this space was as a result of my son's identity crisis about what it means to be a hindu or an indian within the australian context and that is how i started reading about um all of the hindu stuff now for him those were more practical questions what what does it mean and what is what is that good to me today and i suppose it was trying to find a way to connect our present reality with where we come from and uh, that's when i started researching and i came across nilesh ji's talk where he's talking uh, at oxford it was i think nilesh and uh, sankit they were both talking at oxford and i found that so fascinating that i said let me research this a bit more and that's when i started researching sushrut and his samhita Uh, and i ended up doing a 10 part series where we followed the original documentation um sanket actually was able to provide the original documents from a british library and there that's how we did the story and uh, for me the bonus was my son was so fascinated with that when i was able to connect the dots for him and tell him that look today whatever you're seeing in surgery um uh, i think it was the american medical association that tagged uh, the sushrut tweets and he found that so fascinating he said oh my god i had no idea and i think that was what prod me to uh, do that research a bit further so uh, i've done the vaccines research which will go out uh, next month it might be time to take a break from med- medicine because people have started asking me are you a doctor so i said no no i'm not a doctor so it might be time to do something else for a for a change and explore some other topics uh, but that's how i got started it's a, such a fascinating uh, viewpoint because uh, now more and more people are are kind of uh, realizing that the cure is in the treating your food as a medicine what you eat daily you know and, yes. and it brings you to another concept about onion and garlic is it a medicine or a food you know that's a bigger discussion also that why ayurveda treats onion garlic as a medicine not as a food I'll- 
I'll give you an interesting bit of information here. Um, when, when I was doing my research, one of the things we did was we tracked a, um, a, a manuscript. And in that manuscript, that was, that was the manuscript where we find the description of how the nose, uh, Nasika Sadhana is the name of that um, nose job, so to speak. But that appears in, uh, in the manuscript called Navanitakam. And in there, actually, what we find is a mention of Sushrut. And when Sushrut is described, the way his entry is described, he's actually speaking to his guru and they're discussing the properties of garlic. And they're talking about how it can be used as medicine. So that was something that was fascinating we found in uh, Navanitakam. Now, garlic has been used as a medicine for a very long time and different types of available. And in fact, the, the where a person is taken birth, you know, like I'm displaced, I'm from Sholapur, but I'm displaced. So, but where you take in birth, that land gives you enough things for your cure and which is there in the history, throughout the history. So the land produces herbs and, the, and so we are so disconnected from the land. And most of the people, there was a joke in UK a joke or reality, I do not know. So somebody asked a small girl, where do potatoes come from? And she said, Tesco's. Tesco is a chain. <laughs> yeah. you know? so, so that kind of, you know, human society, we are so disconnected. I'm talking about urban centers, especially Western societies, which are highly urbanized. You know, the America, we, we have 50% of the citizens live in urbanized centers. And, uh, and in India, the villages are also reducing. People are going to urban centers for jobs and other things. But, but again, I think the reverse trend is going to start now because of uh, overcrowded cities and other things. So we'll see how it changes. But uh, it was a fascinating discussion, Mitra ji. And uh, thank you for taking out a valuable time to come on the show. Thank you, Aditya ji. Lovely to talk to you and your audience. And we'll come back with Shushruta more. In, in yes, sure. We'll come go into detail in Sushruta. So thank you viewers for watching it. If you like this conversation, it was just an introduction. And uh, if you like this, we'll make it a series. And and if you watch it on YouTube, do comment over there and with all the questions. Thank you. Namaskar.